This program is made possible in part by the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, one of America's top research universities, preparing students for today's interdependent world with internationally focused academic and outreach programs. The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Now, here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. Within seconds of Donald Trump swearing in, the White House website page on climate change was replaced with one that emphasizes, quote, vast untapped domestic energy reserves. From reversing the Obama administration's signature clean energy plan to increasing energy production on federal lands, energy policy is clearly heading in a new direction. To help us understand the Trump administration's approach to energy in America and to explore some policy alternatives, we're joined by two guests on the front lines of the often contentious energy policy debate. Alex Bosmoski is Director of Strategy for the Energy and Enterprise Initiative at George Mason University, which promotes free enterprise action on climate change. Michael Vickerman is Program and Policy Director for Renew Wisconsin, an advocacy organization supporting renewable energy resources. Gentlemen, welcome to International Focus. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, I think uh, a fair first question is, uh, is there a U.S. energy policy? Uh, not um, by name, really, and certainly not a coherent one, but there are uh, fragments of uh, a policy that um, you can find, for example, within the tax code and with uh, certain um, regulations, certain legislation that has regulatory um, um, uh, implications, such as the Clean, a Clean Air Act. Um, but when it comes to uh, certain aspects of the energy policy, um, the states actually have more um, control than um, um, the federal government. Electricity, um, the, the electricity market is one of them. There are really 50 different um, policy domains when it comes to the electric power industry. And Wisconsin is just one of those 50, uh, 50 states. So to the extent that there is any sort of definable, coherent policy. Some critics have said it tends to be focused on crisis response and, in any case, driven by political expedience. Would you say that's a fair characterization? Sure, because most of the anachronistic industrial policy that we have, which is doubles for an energy policy sometimes, was written by members of Congress trying to give a leg up to industries that were in their districts. So you have parochial interest groups that advance specific energy technologies, and we've built a system of industrial policy where various rules and regulations and bureaucrats tip the scales of the energy market in favor of one technology or the other. That happens to be a very expensive way to advance clean energy, and also it ends up competing against itself because both clean energy and fossil energy are in Washington competing for political patronage, and they both get subsidies. There are plenty of fossil fuel subsidies and, and, and favorable treatment for the fossil fuel industry, just like alternative energy. So our energy policy is functionally a set of rules and subsidies that work against each other, some advant ad, uh, advantaging clean energy and some advantaging fossil energy. So let's uh, sort of set the stage, if we could, on just where we are, uh, you know, since at least the Carter administration, there was great concern about energy dependence on, on perhaps less than friendly uh, producers. So where are we now in terms of uh, how much of our energy is imported just across the board? Do we have a good number for that? Well, I believe that about 60% of uh, petroleum and refined products in this country uh, originate in another uh, nation. Um, when it comes to electricity, uh, that number comes very, very close to zero. So it depends on what sector of the economy you're, you're referring to. But uh, right now, the, there was a time when uh, the United States uh, was the leading producer of petroleum uh, in the world, um, but petroleum output peaked around 1970. 
Uh, and there have been, um, it's been generally downhill since that with a few uh, smaller um, uh, increases. So, for example, in the, in the mid-'80s, there was the discovery of uh, Prudhoe Bay and Alaskan oil that actually resulted in uh, an, an increase in output. And then lately, uh, with um, um, uh, the fracking of tight oil deposits, uh, particularly in North Dakota and, and Texas, there's been a little bit of an upsurge there. But that has actually that particular upsurge peaked about a year and a half ago, principally because of low prices. And uh, America seems to be moving back towards its old imp oil importing ways. And we should s clarify, too, that the energy independence narrative that's been built around how much energy we import versus how much we export and, and use internally uh, is built on this fundamental myth that importing and or that that using domestically create or, or produced oil takes away resources from the unfriendly governments that produce oil in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf oil is a internationally traded fungible commodity our our use and consumption of oil in this country pours money into the coffers of those unfriendly governments no matter how much we drill at home we can affect the supply and demand of the international oil market, but it is an international oil market. Other energy technologies are less internationally fungible. Like natural gas, for example, we have uh, infrastructure barriers and regulatory barriers to exporting our natural gas. This is perhaps one way where the Trump administration could take action to lower emissions that's very popular with conservatives, because globalizing the American natural gas revolution is a very effective way to reduce global emissions. But we can't, for, for the most part, there are very few export terminals that have been built to ship our natural gas overseas and help countries like Japan um, use more natural gas to replace coal. So, uh, you know, you bring up coal, we'll get into that in just a bit. But in the overall energy mix, uh, that's changed certainly in the, the last decade, hasn't it? The, um, rather remarkably in the last three or four years. Uh, what was once, uh, uh, looking at all 50 states, um, uh, largely a province of coal with some nuclear and, um, and natural gas. Uh, natural gas is just about ready to eclipse coal as a source of electric energy. Nuclear has pretty much stayed the same. It may have declined slightly. Uh, and then as well, there's been significant advance, particularly in, in wind power, um, that now accounts for somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of the nation's electricity. And depending on the state, in certain states, uh, wind power accounts for more than a quarter of all kilowatt hours generated in that state. Um, and this trend is continuing. Um, there is no rebound in sight for coal. Um, natural gas prices remain low and will outcompete uh, coal for um, uh, what we call baseload and intermediate generation. And uh, equally as remarkable as natural gas's price behavior over the last five years is the plummeting costs of wind and solar to the point where, in some places, they can even uh, meet or uh, uh, can be generated for less than the cost of a new natural gas plant. It's a very, very different economic picture uh, now than, than was in place, even as, as, uh, as uh, relative, relatively um, five years ago. So I think it's really important to celebrate the huge advances that wind and solar have made in this country. And it's true that we've increased our utilization of these technologies by leaps and bounds over even the last five years. But it's also important to remember that since the 1990s, our, we've prematurely retired nuclear plants in this country, and the share of electricity generated by nuclear power has fallen since the 1990s from 36 percent down to 31 percent, and that reduction in nuclear power cause, causes an increase in emissions that would be equal to about 900 solar power plants. It's very important that we include in nuclear and natural gas in the way that we're thinking about our energy future, because we, wind and solar, intermittent energy sources, are nowhere near scalable to our full energy needs at the moment. We'll get there, but 
it's a long way off, and we need to be realists with respect to how much, how badly we need nuclear and natural gas, not just for accessible and affordable energy, but to meet climate change goals. Alex raises what I consider to be a sort of a double-edged argument uh, when it comes to nuclear. I think he's absolutely right that uh, having built uh, nuclear power plants 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it really makes no sense to see these plants go offline, considering the uh, amount of investment that went into them. And they are actually dropping off one by one um, as a result of the market competition at the wholesale level. Um, and um, this is kind of a problem. On the other hand, the cost of building a new nuclear plant is absolutely prohibitive. Uh, and it is um, resulting in um, huge cost overruns and construction delays that could not be tolerated in um, a, a, a deregulated market environment. Um, and so the only way you can get a new nuclear power plant built in this country today is if it were uh, a project of the Tennessee Valley Authority or a very large monopoly utility. And that particular capacity option going forward should be taken off the table because it is just fantastically expensive, expensive, and those dollars could be put to much more productive use going after wind, solar, perhaps new hydro, um, and natural gas. Well, uh, we said at the outset things are likely to, to take a, a fairly dramatic turn in terms of the policy environment. Recently, the New York Times characterized what we're likely to see as uh, Obama focused on climate change and renewables, Trump is focusing on fossil fuels and related extractive jobs. Would you say that's a fair characterization as what we've seen so far? It's a fair characterization of the rhetoric we've seen so far, but you can't get far down the policymaking agenda without recognizing that there's 80,000 workers in the extractive coal industry in America and 370,000 in the solar industry. A jobs president and a jobs congress will have to pay serious attention to where the jobs are, and the jobs are in renewable energy. You're right that we're going to see a new direction, and you're right that the president has given a lot of uh, lip service to fossil energy. And in some respects, lifting barriers on investments and infrastructure are important for safety and efficiency and emissions. But the president has also promised to bring coal jobs back and blamed the Environmental Protection Agency for the loss of those jobs in the first place. Those are myths. That's not true. Like Michael said, natural gas has outcompeted coal. Well, someone uh, suggested it was a bit like uh, going to Nantucket and promising to return the whaling industry jobs back. I mean, is, is it that anachronistic at this point? No, just because there is still a hope for coal. There's still hope for coal that if we have smart policy in this country where pollution or uh, markets are accountable for pollution, that the incentive to innovate is, is, could push coal far enough up the innovation curve that carbon capture utilization and storage could make it a sustainable fuel for the long term. But right now, there has not been the political will in Congress to push that technology. And without a price on carbon, private sector innovation won't develop it. I think you know, your question um, does get to the president's intentions. I mean, he would like to see um, uh, a change in policy. But unfortunately, while he could rewrite um, EPA um, policy, he really can't rewrite economics. And um, that is what is ailing the coal industry right now. It is not regulation. Um, it is the fact that um, coal is um, a more expensive resource because coal plants are an older form of generation. And, uh, the utilities actually are starting to recognize that, and they're not really buying um, uh, Trump's rhetoric, and uh, and they shouldn't because uh, they're starting to recognize the value of uh, diversity in their generation portfolio, the avoidance of regulatory risk either today or in the future, and also. Uh, fuel sources that carry a price. And natural gas is very, very inexpensive, but it still has a price. So does coal. Um, and, um, and they're thinking that um, uh, 
price-free energy sources, at least some portion of their portfolio, por, excuse me, portfolio should be dedicated to that. So uh, as much as Trump would, uh, would like us to believe that there is a rebound um, uh, being baked into uh, the nation's economic future for the next four years, I, I, I think it's actually going to be in the other direction, that there will actually be substantially fewer coal plants operating in, at the end of his term, first term, if there is a second term, versus where there, what there is right now. We, we even saw today in Wisconsin, they announced that the present Plary coal plant would be shut down half of the year. And they, uh, why is that? Is it because of the EPA, you know, uh, overreach? No, it's because natural gas is cheaper. Right. And it's not just, I mean, the president promised bringing these jobs back to real people. He got 83% of the vote in some counties in West Virginia that have 10% unemployment that have been hit really hard by the out production or by natural gas beating coal. And he went there and he said, I will bring your jobs back. And in one of the more disgusting parts of the campaign, he actually mimicked a coal miner digging coal and he said that I, um, I hope that the moms and dads that, you know, in the coal mining industry can, um, can see their kids grow up to be coal miners. What? I don't, I don't know many parents that want to see their kids grow up to be coal miners. The American dream is that your kids grow up to be more prosperous than you are. So I think it's a cop-out on behalf of conservatives to, to tell working class communities in Appalachia and other coal mining areas that we're going to bring their jobs back by taking away the authority of a government agency. We should be straight with those people. Those communities require economic development and other pathways to jobs that, you know, vocational training and attention from the government to actually put forward solutions. This is a cop-out. It's not a solution. So, uh, you know, said. If, if regulatory issues are not... Uh, the solution, in your view, Alex. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, I know one of your organization's really centerpiece proposals of a carbon tax. First of all, for people who might not be familiar, just explain how that works. A carbon tax attaches the price of pollution to the activities that pollute. So it makes it more expensive to pollute. Right now, the status quo is that you can dump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere for free. Those greenhouse gases cause consequences, which have costs for Americans, and those costs are diffused across society. So what a carbon tax does is it makes the fuels accountable for their pollution. It also allows us to improve energy and climate policy dramatically. This is what I hope conservatives learn or, or do in this new administration. We've had an industrial policy and a regulatory approach to climate change for the last eight years. Conservatives should say this is a real problem and we have a better way. And that better way is free enterprise. So we're going to unwind the, uh, the regulatory apparatus that has accreted over the generations and all these subsidies, well not all the subsidies, some of them are already sunset out. So, um, but we can unwind a lot of government programs that proxy for a price on carbon. And a lot of those proxies are really inefficient. So they cost upwards of two, three hundred dollars per ton of carbon through to get that emission reduction through a government program. But we could get that reduction for $10 in California right now in their market-based mechanism. Or if we used a transparent carbon tax in America, all companies would have a predictable understanding of their pollution costs and would be able to innovate around those costs. It also changes the dynamic in Washington so that energy companies start to compete on a level playing field for consumers. Instead of the status quo right now, which is a lot of energy lobbyists competing for political patronage. And they get it. They get a lot of political patronage. And a carbon tax can help in that. We can clean this up. Let's have a fair market with true free enterprise. You pay for your pollution and then you compete for consumers. So are we going to see a carbon tax anytime soon? <laughs> uh, well, it would have to be a very different Washington than, than what we have right now. Um, the any time an industry is given uh, preferential treatment, whether in the tax code or regulatory sphere, uh, the, the economic benefit is 
not just enough to make that particular industry viable, but also enough to hire lobbyists and lawyers uh, to create a kind of uh, protective edifice around that particular policy. And um, th those interests uh, would be um, among the first um, to feel the, um, the shift in the economic balance that would come from a, a carbon tax. So believe me, they're already out there um, uh, whispering in uh, congressional ears about how this, the country is not ready for it and um, they may have uh, other messages as well. I would like to think that um, if you take away the influence of, of uh, money, particularly the Citizens United levels of money that flow through uh, uh, political contributions, you might get a, a fair and deliberate hearing on that issue. I, I think it deserves that, and um, I, but I am also skeptical, skeptical about um, new taxes being uh, adopted in this country. And remember that uh, moment in the Mondale campaign where he basically said, yes, I'm going to raise your taxes. Um, you know, that, that, that didn't go over so well, at least in 49 of the 50 states that he competed in. It's much easier to angle for subsidies and uh, regulatory favors, and that's why we have them. Um, and I just don't see um, a change in the political, in the, in the mechanics, the operations of Congress um, that would permit a different kind of approach like a new uh, tax. I think it's actually potentially a really good idea, but um, that's not the way Congress works. So are you packing up your office and uh, going home, or do you have a response? I, I, I'm, money plays a role in politics. Special interest groups play a role in politics. Constituents play an extraordinarily powerful role in politics. Right now, conservative members of Congress, they understand that leadership on climate change will alienate their base, a, a, a substantial part of especially the fringe part of their base and the Tea Party part of their base, which in some districts is very important in a primary. It's not well understood that leadership on climate will earn you the respect and admiration and support of a lot of people who don't know they're conservatives yet. They have conservative principles and conservative ideals, but maybe they care deeply about climate change and are alienated from conservatism because of that. Or this election was not a referendum on climate. The majority of Trump voters, six out of 10, want either a carbon tax or regulation to control CO2 emissions. If conservative voters in conservative districts speak up and let their members of Congress know they care about this issue, as soon as conservatives in Congress start looking for the better way on climate, the replacement to the Clean Power Plan, just like we've struggled with the replacement to Obamacare, we need to struggle with a replacement to the Clean Power Plan, and you'll find quickly, if you stay within the boundaries of small government, free enterprise, conservative principles, you gotta, there's really one solution. It's your tax carbon, and the revenue from that tax is returned to the taxpayers, either by making the tax code more efficient, like buying down our rates on income tax or investment, and um, uh, or um, we go another approach, and that approach would be more a parochial view of specific energy technologies, which is really playing on the other side's turf. You know, you're picking winners and losers again and trying to ingratiate yourself with the, the environmental consciousness of America by saying that you're pro-solar or pro-all of the above. But the policy that will unite conservatives ultimately, when we take this seriously issue, or this issue seriously, will have to, will have to be a carbon tax. Well, you know, if I could, Michael, one of the, the changes, I think, in the last several years is the, the stereotypical sort of Northern California tree hugger renewable interest no longer applies. I mean, there, there are some very red states that are now very much have embraced the, the renewable portion of the energy portfolio, haven't they? For very practical reasons. Um, and they flow f primarily from economic development. Now, I, I agree with Alex that um, constituents um, are do think that uh, climate change is an issue that they that that should be addressed, but I'm not quite sure if they if it's a, a top priority issue. That's true. Um, moreover, be, 
given the way uh, climate works, um, it's not generally perceived of as an immediate threat, but rather as something that is a growing threat. Um, the trouble with growing threats is that um, it, it places more of a premium on uh, waiting for some sort of magic bullet um, to arrive in, in 10 years' time that will save us from the um, from uh, three degree higher temperatures across the planet. Um, and so there is that tendency to put off what could be done today. Um, but uh, back to your uh, point about um, the political, where, where is renewable energy, uh, clean energy happening? It is happening um, in the Great Plains states, um, which is primarily Republican. It is happening in the Pacific Coast states, primarily Democratic. And it's happening now, starting to filter into the uh, um, uh, the Great Lakes states, which is mixed. Um, but that certainly, once a state gets a taste of uh, the be the benefits to the local tax base um, and the benefits to landowners, now they now they have two crops that they're growing on their fields instead of one. Um, and also the uh, attendant manufacturing concerns that, that uh, crop up. The state of Iowa has uh, become a wind power manufacturing center. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it at that. Uh, we've run out of time. Alex Bosmoski, Michael Vickerman, thank you very much. We'll keep apprised of developments, and we'll see you next time on International Focus. This program is made possible in part by the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, one of America's top research universities, preparing students for today's interdependent world with internationally focused academic and outreach programs.